Hello, everyone. Uh, today we're joined by uh, John Nymeister. He's an artist working on the Smite video game, and he's doing the uh, digital painting course on Proco. Uh, today he'll be answering your questions. Um, also, if you guys would like to win a free copy of his course, uh, comment below, and we'll be give it, doing a giveaway at the end of the stream. Um, if, if you want to buy it, it's also on pre-sale or on sale as well. So, yeah. Do uh, you have anything to add, John? No, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, hello, hello, everyone. Uh, excited to be here. Going to just have a nice, relaxing, kind of chill and paint time. Um, feel free to, to ask questions while we're going through this. Uh, there should be a link at the top of the video that you can submit questions. Uh, and yeah, we're just going to be getting started. Proco.com slash 609. That's where yeah. I will be reading the questions from. Sweet. All right. Uh, so yeah, as you probably guessed from the title, today we're going to be doing a little bit of a, a fantasy portrait from reference. So using reference as kind of a starting point, but changing it into our own original image. So since this is more of a painting demo uh, than a drawing demo, I went ahead and got started just kind of fleshing out a sketch for this character pretty quick. I've left it a little bit of a, a blank slate as I'll be uh, doing a lot of the the fantasizing <laughs> in paint. Uh, but yeah, we'll get to that. Uh, so I usually like to uh, start with a setup kind of like this, where I have my drawing on one layer and then just sort of fill it in with a flat tone underneath. And then I can start digging in with uh, some base colors. I usually try to start off with something in kind of a, a mid-tone range, like not really not really a shadow and not really a highlight, uh, just getting some groundwork without getting too much contrast right at the beginning. And we can always change these later on with adjustment layers and such, but uh, I find getting some flat colors in makes it easier for me to uh, sort of set things up. And then I can add uh, some lighting and such with various layer modes or paint it directly. I'm also just using a, a soft round for this. I could potentially use more of a texture brush, um, depending on like the style of painting I'm going for. Usually I go for a pretty like clean render look. Uh, so the soft brush actually works pretty well for me. Uh, a lot of people tend to disparage it a little bit for being too fake and digital, but uh, it's really about the ways that you use it uh, more so than the brush itself. It can be really good for creating nice edges and smooth transitions. And uh, you can break that up after the fact with some texture brushes if it's feeling too digital. I'm going to get some local color shifts in these flat tones as well. So these aren't shadows, but they're areas where the skin itself is kind of changing color. And I want to keep these pretty subtle. But still uh, have a little bit of presence there. And this will make my shadow layer a little bit more dynamic once I finally get it on there. I'm also going to get some like colder tones sort of towards the bottom of the face. Um, I use the word blue for that, but it's actually just a relative blue. So I'm taking the base color of the skin. And then if I actually just desaturate and darken it a little bit, you can see it looks colder by comparison. Uh, and this is a very common trick used by in like traditional uh, portrait painting. Uh, if you look at like Sargent or Zorn or any of those old masters, uh, you'll see this technique used a lot uh, and when people talk about putting cold tones in the face what they really mean is very desaturated warm tones and just that uh, contrast between the two makes one feel colder and one feel warmer all right so with that, I've got some nice base colors laid in. I'm going to go ahead and throw some very quick shadows on this. I'm make a new layer 
set to multiply. Always a good idea to name your layers. Uh, and for this, I'm going to use this nice dual edged brush. Uh, you can see that depending on the direction that I move my pen in, it has a hard edge on one side and a soft edge on the other. So if you've gone through the Proco figure drawing course where uh, Stan talks about laying in uh, core shadows, uh, cast shadows and form shadows using a variety of edges, this brush is a really good uh, way to sort of mimic that technique. Uh, you'll also notice that I'm taking my shadow layer and clipping it to my fill layer. Uh, basically what this means is that anything I paint on the shadow layer will be constrained to the pixels of the fill layer. So I don't have to worry about uh, painting inside the lines. And you can do that just by pressing Control Alt G. Your layer will clip to the layer below. You can also hold Alt and just click between the two layers and it'll do the same thing. So uh, start throwing in some shadows here. Again, I don't want them to be like super contrasty. I can always increase contrast later. It's usually easier to add contrast than it is to take away. And I'm not going to be following the like values and colors of the reference exactly. Um, uh, a common misconception, and one of the main things I want to kind of touch on with this demo is sort of how to use a reference to create your own work. Uh, and the thing with reference is it's just that, it's reference. It's a thing for you to refer to while you're working. Uh, it's not something that you have to rigidly copy, um, you know, color for color, shape for shape. It's just there to provide you with information and you as the artist are free to change it in whatever way you wish. So right now, this reference is very useful for me to see where I need to put uh, these shadow patterns. And that's going to save me a lot of time having to like experiment and figure it out on my own. So even though I'm not necessarily copying the, the colors of the reference, uh, I'm using it to find where I need to place these shadows. And even with that, um, I'm not completely bound to the way the reference is set up. If I want to change the shadow pattern a little bit uh, for my own illustrative purposes, that's totally fine too. Uh, and I think I actually will, because I don't love in the reference how the shadow from the nose kind of connects all the way with the shadow on the cheek. Uh, I'd rather there be like a little bit of light space in there. So I'm actually going to shorten the shadow of the nose and without seeing the reference, no one would notice. <laughs> and I try to be a little bit, a little bit more careful with this step. Um, it's easy to like rush through it and think, you know, that you're just kind of adding some shadows and you know just slap in some messy shapes and call it a day. But uh, if you take your time and really invest in each step before you move on to the next one, you can save yourself a lot of cleanup time uh, later on. Uh, because anytime you're, there's certain steps of painting that just aren't as fun as others, but anytime you rush through one of those to get to the next step, you're just creating more work for yourself later on. Because uh, you, at some point, are going to have to deal with that issue. And the more you, time you invest into a painting, then the more time it takes to change and adjust things later on. So be patient, take your time, uh, and have fun with it. Cool. Um, let me know if you would like any questions, by the way. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, I'm looking forward to taking your course in March. I assume this course's lessons will be released one at a time so students have time to work on them and submit work for critique and for you to have time to group crits as well. Will this be structured as weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, et cetera, uh, or release? Awesome. Yeah, I'm glad you're excited for it. Uh, I believe the current plan is to release episodes weekly. 
Uh, there will probably be some shorter breaks between the different parts of the course. So it's broken up into four different parts, and there will probably be a slight uh, delay between part one and part two, for instance. But uh, overall, the plan is to release an episode a week, and that should give you plenty of time to follow along and do all the homework and everything. Cool. Um, this person asks, uh, my largest struggle is creating something other than painting the reference. Uh, any exercises and tips to start being able to paint things that aren't uh, there like you do? I'm a beginner in this creation slash creating a work. Um, yeah, uh, a big part of it is just practice. Um, but it's also knowing that there's always some kind of reference that you can use to to help you. So if you're painting something that isn't there, there must be something in the real world that's vaguely similar to that. So you can either use that as reference for your piece directly, or you can set aside some time to like do studies of that subject and see if you can get better at painting it so you can understand uh, its structure and form. And then you'll have a, a much better foundation laid for when you try to paint things like that from your imagination or uh, distort or stylize them to fit with whatever your imaginative painting is. Uh, yeah, because there's definitely a lot of uh, unconventional or like exaggerated things that you paint in fantasy and sci-fi art, but it's always at least to some degree grounded in reality. So it kind of falls on you to find where those parallels are with reality and build up that reference for yourself. Um, uh, uh, where did you train, John? Uh, I went to an online school. Uh, it was called the Art Department, and it has since uh, changed to be Visual Arts Passage. Uh, it's technically a different organization, but a lot of the same instructors are there. Um, yeah, so I went there for two and a half years from 2010 to 20, like 12, mid 2012. Um, had, had a really great experience there. Um, learned a lot of useful information. And then it took me another like <laughs> two or three years to actually understand and apply that information. So. Hmm. Um, did, did you uh, train uh, traditionally at all? Or is it all digital or mostly digital? Uh, it was a good mix of both. Most of our fundamentals classes uh, were traditional. So we did a lot of figure drawing with pastels. Uh, we did portrait drawing with charcoal. We had some oil painting classes, things like that. Um, and then most of my industry classes were, because I studied a mixture of illustration and entertainment art, um, and all of those were pretty much uh, choose your own medium. So I was working in Photoshop for those. Hmm. I do think it's a good idea for sure to at least experiment with traditional. Um, these days, it's really easy to to get a tablet and something like Clip Studio Paint that's affordable and accessible, uh, and just start your whole career with digital painting. Uh, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. That's technically what I did. I started off with digital before I ever touched really anything traditional, at least in a serious sense. Um, but it is worth uh, practicing a little bit with traditional materials because they teach you uh, sensitivity and um, muscle control. You have to be very delicate with traditional materials and you have to plan out your piece more before you start laying down marks uh, simply for the fact that because it's physical, it's much more permanent and you have to be a little bit more careful. And some of that mentality is actually very useful for digital artists. So I do recommend uh, spending at least a little bit of time working with traditional media, even if you plan to be primarily a digital artist. Right. 
Um, let's see. Uh, hi, I signed up for your course and can't wait. Uh, do you have any tips on what I should slash could practice before starting the course? Uh, the main thing I would recommend is getting some solid drawing fundamentals under your belt. Uh, the course is going to be mostly painting focused. So while we will touch on some drawing topics, uh, there's not going to be time to go very in depth with them. So uh, I would recommend being comfortable drawing forms in perspective, uh, having a, a solid figure drawing um, fundamentals laid would definitely be very helpful. So uh, if you haven't already, my main recommendation is to go through Proko's figure drawing course. Uh, that lays a lot of the groundwork that you'll need for the digital painting course, uh, especially because um, an important thing with painting is that it's really still just drawing. Uh, you're just using a bigger brush. So uh, a lot of the things Proko covers in the, the figure course about uh, drawing shapes in perspective, how to light and render them. Uh, that's all the same knowledge that you need for painting. You're just applying it in a slightly different way. Uh, yeah, so I would say just practice your, your drawing, practice perspective, uh, and figure drawing is always a, a great place to start. Mm -hmm. um, who are the, or this is me asking, but who are the artists that you generally look at for your art that inspire you? Um, there's a whole bunch and it changes over the years. Um, for professional work, when I'm doing splash art and stuff, uh, there's a lot of really great artists over at Riot. I tend to look at like Victor Mori and Cheng Wei Pan. Uh, Alex Flores is really good. Um, but I also think it's important to sort of branch away from the type of work that you're doing. Uh, because you don't want to just be like a secondhand copy of someone else. So uh, a lot of artists I tend to look at also fall into like golden age illustrators, like Lion Decker, uh, Dean Cornwell, um, you know, Norman Rockwell, folks like that. The legends. Yeah. Um, have you been to the Stockton Museum in Stockton, the Hagen Museum, I mean? Uh, I haven't. What's there? It is the uh, the largest collection of J.C. Leindecker paintings in the world. Oof. So, I want to go there. <laughs> yeah. That's very cool. That in the uh, Society of Illustrators. Yeah. I did get to see, uh, when I was out in San Diego for a couple years, there was a, a museum that had a, a Golden Age Illustrators exhibit, and I got to see oh, cool. a handful of Leindeckers and Rockwells in person, and they were That's just fun. astounding. Yeah, seeing this stuff, seeing that stuff is, is really cool. Uh, let's see. Um, I've heard artists like Devin Corwin describe the painting process like a pyramid, drawing, value, edges, color slash temperature. Using this pyramid as reference, how would you order these to describe your process? And what tips would you give other artists to improve their workflow? Yeah. Um... I think I would generally agree with that layout. Uh, and you can kind of see that here. Um, I started with just the drawing, and then I filled it in with colors, yes. But technically, those colors are just uh, its more important, the, the values that I'm laying down. So you can see if I go back to this initial lay-in, the figure is reading pretty much entirely as a mid-tone or dark shape against a light background. Um, and I've just done this enough that I can paint in color and kind of see through to the values underneath. Um, but if you feel like you're struggling with that, getting that nice clear value read, then uh, starting in black and white and colorizing it later can be very hap uh, helpful. Um, and I'm trying to maintain that throughout the entire process. So as I'm going and painting this, uh, I'm probably not gonna be painting highlights that are this bright and shiny because that value is the same as the background value. So I'm going to start sort of punching holes in the figure if I do that. Um, so yeah, drawing first, value second. Um, composition is quite important. And then edges is 
also important, but it's more of like a, a rendering thing. Uh, so it's a, a little bit more, it's not quite as important as, as drawing and value in my opinion, but uh, it is very essential to creating a convincing and realistic looking painting, if that's your goal. Also, if any of y'all are not following Devin Corwin, you should be, because he posts lots of really great art tips for free on his Twitter. Yes, Devin Corwin. Um, and uh, as Ben Rasmussen did a demo on Proco a while ago. Doing, oh, really? Yeah, a line decker style, you know, breaking down Golden Age illustrators into a modern style. That's awesome. Said I missed that. Um, what colors do I use to paint a snow white beard and hair in oils uh, slash can you do a brief demo to show the texture? Uh, I, I guess not doing it in oils, but I guess you could, you know. A white beard? Yeah, yeah. I guess they're asking, you know, um, how would you uh, show the um, colors for a snow white beard? Yeah. Um... So white's a tricky color because it reflects the colors around it. Uh, and you also have to be sure you leave yourself value space for highlights. So uh, depending on like the overall colors of the scene, uh, just assuming that like, let's say this guy, these values are gonna be too much, but just for quick argument's sake, uh, let's say this guy is out in sunny daylight. So in that case, the shadow side of the beard would start to fall into more of like bluer tones. And then the light side of the beard would pick up some of the warmer tones from the sun. And then you might even get, depending on the environment, some interesting reflected light. So if he's standing in a field of grass, you might get like some green bounce light from underneath. If he's standing over, like standing on a beach, you might get some warm bounce light so uh it's a it's a hard answer a hard question to answer because there's a million different variables for any kind of like what color should i choose question and it all depends on the material that you're trying to paint and the uh environment and the lighting situation that the character is in uh, so i would suggest like thinking thinking about your your light sources and the colors and uh, how light is bouncing around the scene and try to make your decision based on that. Yeah, and I, I guess the one of the answers to getting better at that stuff is just doing tons of studies. Yeah, absolutely. Um, kind of back to what we were talking about before, you know, there's tons of great uh, references out there of white beards and any uh, imaginable lighting scenario. So just grab one of those references and it doesn't really matter if it matches your painting perfectly uh, because you can just refer to it for the colors or for the shape or the textures and then sort of reinterpret that into your own painting. Hmm. Are you ready for the next question? Yeah, go for it. Cool. Uh, do you think it's better to focus on one branch of art? Uh, example, only concept art, only animation, or is it okay to do a couple of these and keep trying out new things? For example, I really like to do concept art, but I love doing comics or any storytelling art. I don't know if I should focus on one of these or what's, I want to do both, but don't know if I will live long enough to really master both. <laughs> uh, well, I would say you definitely have plenty of time. And the nice thing about art is that all of those skills feed into each other. So the better you get at drawing and doing concept art, the easier drawing comics will be uh, as you build those fundamental skills. Um, a, lot of, a lot of it depends on what your personal goals are. If you're just doing art for fun, then absolutely just do everything at once and have a good time with it. Uh, if you're trying to make a career out of it, I think it's generally better to start by focusing in one specific area and then branching out after you've established yourself. 
just because it does take quite a bit of time to learn all these various skills and you're less likely to get hired if you're half good at a bunch of things rather than really good at just one specific thing. So a lot of it depends on your personal goals and also how far along you are in your artistic journey. Like if you've been doing this for 10 years and you're confident in the things that you like, then just it's probably time to, you know, think about focusing in and narrowing down a little bit. But if you're just starting out drawing and painting, then I think it's a great idea to experiment more and try out a bunch of different things and see which ones you actually enjoy doing the most. Because uh, it's one thing to enjoy looking at a type of art, and it's another to enjoy making that type of art. <laughs> like, uh, like I could, I can very much appreciate a well-crafted comic panel, uh, but I would never in a million years want to work in comics because I do not have the the patience for that much drawing. Um, so yeah, uh, that was kind of a full of caveats answer, but hopefully helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's I think it's a good answer. Um, I, I think with art, you know, as long as you focus on the fundamentals, you're probably doing the right thing. And, yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. I mean, it's all it's all drawing one way or another. So as long as you're building your skills, then you can kind of flex those into whatever industry or arena fits you best. Yeah, yeah. And I, I don't know if you'd agree with this, but I would say probably do the thing that just, you know, you enjoy doing the most. Um, like the thing you can see yourself doing for 20 years, 20, 30 years. And, uh... Yeah, absolutely. And I would add to that too, like, don't just think about the, the thing or the subject matter that you enjoy the most, but also think about the process you enjoy the most uh, or the part of the process you enjoy the most. Like for me, this right here is kind of my happy place of rendering and painting. And so I did a lot of this and I got uh, significantly better at rendering and painting. And that's actually what ended up getting me a job as a splash artist because the one thing those really, really have to be is super heavily rendered. And uh, a good chunk of people just don't have the, haven't developed the patience to work on a single painting for 40, 60, 80, 100 hours. Um, so having that skill helped me sort of land my career. Um, and it's it happened because I was pursuing the part of the process that I enjoyed the most. I love painting and rendering and working with light and color and doing these minute little value shifts to get the form to read just right. Uh, and so I did a lot of that, and it led me down the path that started my career. Nice. Um, let's see. I guess this is kind of related. Um, this is more of a general question, but how do you uh, have fun making art when your skills aren't at the level you want? I'm just starting my art journey and I find it hard to start anything because I don't feel like I can create anything. Yeah, uh, that's a tough one. Um, and it's really just a matter of personal reflection and introspection in a way, because uh, uh, you have to learn to deal with that because that feeling never goes away. Uh, not to be bleak, but <laughs> no matter how good you get with art, you can always be better. And you're always looking at that one person who does it better than you. So you have to develop uh, a security in yourself that it's not about being the best. It's not about being as good or better than someone else. It's just about, are you having fun doing this thing and if you're doing it, are you better than you were last month or last year or 10 years ago? Uh, and as long as you're enjoying it and steadily improving, then uh, you're doing all the right things. And I know it's it's not a an easy thing to do to just say, oh, I'll just put all my emotions aside and not think about this anymore. But uh, yeah, it's a it's an attitude you have to proactively develop to be happy and content as an artist. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that like, um, you know, I, I think you are right. Like as you keep getting better, you have a better eye for, 
you know, where you might be lacking. And um, there's that Bob Ross quote, where as long as you're, you've done a painting, you've had a great day. You know, if you are doing yeah. a painting, that means you're probably not, you know, uh, you know, lifting super, super heavy things or yeah, uh, you're not really worrying about much else if you have the ability to paint. So yeah, um, absolutely. Like uh, trying to frame it in a way to where even if you do something that's not up to your standards where you want to be, uh, you're still doing the thing that you love doing and the thing you'd be choosing to do, even if you had, you know, all the skills in the world or, you know, all the money. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think it's important to keep that kind of like childlike playful attitude about it. Um, like Bob Ross very much had it. Uh, I think James Gurney is one of my favorite artists, one because he's amazing, but also because he's retained that attitude through a very long and successful career. Uh, if you, you know, watch his videos of him doing plein air paintings these days, he just looks like he's having fun. Like he's out and about, he's finding random locations that seem interesting to him and he gets to paint for a bit and he has a blast doing it. So uh, I think focus on that, uh, focus on enjoying the process and don't, don't bother yourself quite so much with the goal because if you're making art, then you're, you're getting better and you'll always, you know, want to be better than you are. But the one right. thing you can really control is enjoying the process. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I feel like for a lot of people, there is this awkward phase where you're, you know, you start getting a lot of traction, you start to see yourself get better, but you're not quite good enough to at least to feel like you can get a job. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like some, the impulse for some people is to go and try and do it like as quickly as possible, like try and do it in a year or a couple of years or something. And, you know, um, which I, I think, I guess, in my opinion, the less amount of stress surrounded around getting better, the more fun it'll be in general. Um, yeah, and, absolutely. Um, well, the more you can enjoy it, the more you'll, uh, the more you'll do it. And as a result of doing it more and enjoying it more, you'll probably get better faster. Yeah, for sure. It's also important. Uh, I tend to ramble about this a bit to my students as well, um, to not rush into turning your art into a job, like as fast as humanly possible. Um, that's certainly a goal worth having and something you can and should pursue if this is your, your passion and your interest. Uh, but it's important to remember that as soon as you get a job, it's very time and energy consuming and you have significantly less time to devote to improving your work. So it's better to have some patience and uh, focus on your skills first because you can always push to, to start your career. But once you've started, it's really hard to stop. So it's better to invest in your skills first get yourself to a place where you're happy with what you can do and you know that you can land a, a strong supportive job that's going to actually pay your bills yeah yeah, yeah absolutely um, yeah and I, I think again as i think the goal of art is to have fun painting and enjoying it and the more stressful it, it is i guess um, you know, I think you can have a job where you are learning a lot and getting better, but um, I hear all the time from professional artists that the happiest times as uh, as an artist were generally as students um, because they, they had more creative freedom to explore the stuff they wanted to, to explore. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's pleasure in, in both sides of that, that journey. Um, but I definitely like my my really only regret with my career is that I did uh, focus so hard on getting work so quickly, and if I had just had a little bit more patience and shored up some of the skills that I wasn't as strong on, like my perspective and my figure drawing, uh, I could have saved myself several years of very low paying jobs. <laughs> Let's see. Um, 
Will this course uh, cover how to draw textures like metal, hair, fur, etc.? Um, I have also wanted to make splash illustrations like Riot Games. Does this course go over, over how to do that? Um, yes to the first question. We're definitely going to cover painting materials and textures. Uh, there will be a whole uh, video devoted to like how light works and uh, how you can use that to understand the way that certain textures appear. And then in later videos, we'll be going into actual you know, step-by-step -step process of how to paint those things. Um, to the second part of the question, yes and no. Uh, I am a splash artist, and I will be showing you my process. So technically, you will be learning a splash art process, but uh, the course is really just painting in general. So you're going to learn a lot of fundamental painting techniques, and it can be applied to splash art, or it could be applied to you know, more traditional Magic the Gathering D&D style work or editorial illustration. Uh, the course isn't really bound by a particular style. It's more about fundamentals and techniques. Um, I guess this is uh, slightly related as well, but uh, will, this cover, will this course cover face anatomy or body anatomy? Um, not really. Uh, like I said, it's mostly going to be focused on painting techniques and anatomy is much more of a drawing thing. So if you're struggling with facial anatomy or figure anatomy, uh, I would recommend going through some of the other courses on Proko, uh, to help shore up those skills. Uh, his portrait drawing course is great and his figure drawing course is great. And I would definitely recommend doing the figure drawing course before doing the anatomy course, because those simpler fundamentals are much more important uh, when you're first starting off than learning all the muscles and the names and the connections of the anatomy. Hmm. Um, yeah, yeah I, I guess I always hear from illustrators that the key thing is always fundamentals. and. Um, you know, it always comes back to anatomy and perspective and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, even the stuff I'm doing here, like I'm I'm painting things and, you know, adding highlights and shadows and reflected lights, but all of that only matters because of understanding, you know, those big, simple forms of the head. And we've got a bottom plane there. So that means there's going to be shadows happening in here. And the nose is sort of like a, a wedge coming out in the 3D space. And my light source is up here. So that wedge is going to be casting a shadow. All the stuff pertaining to painting of like, where do I put the shadow? Where's the highlight going to be? What value should I choose? Uh, that all comes back to drawing skills and understanding uh, how to draw forms in space. So definitely very important to, to focus on that if you're interested in painting realistically. Um, will you cover creating brushes to create texture and realism? Yep, absolutely. Uh, it's in the Pretty early on in the course, actually, there's a, a section on creating custom brushes. Uh, and one thing to note about brushes, just while we're chatting about it, um, when it comes to texture brushes, it's really more about the, the texture itself than it is having a brush to per paint a particular thing. Like this brush I will often use for hair but it's not a hair brush. Uh, it's just a brush that happens to have a texture somewhat similar to hair. And you'll see, you saw earlier on with this portrait, I actually blocked the hair in using this brush because uh, with the references I'm looking at, I feel like this slightly more compact, grittier texture is actually closer to the texture of these dreadlocks that this character has. So uh, using my hairbrush would actually be kind of the wrong call because it doesn't match the texture of that surface. So um, having texture brushes is really about 
uh, just the texture itself and the, the edge quality of that brush. Uh, it's not a shortcut to have the brush do all the work for you. It's just a convenience of this is already closer to what I want out of the final product. So if I use a brush with that texture, I'm going to save myself time. Um, do you ever think about color profiles like uh, SRBG, Apple RGB, CMYK, et cetera, when doing a painting? I've discovered that color prof color profiles a while ago, and I don't know if something is if it's something to worry about or not. Um, I personally don't really think about it. Uh, the only time it's relevant in my work is if I'm doing an illustration that's going to be printed, either as like a book or uh, this year I did like some tarot card illustrations. Uh, and so because those are going to be physically printed and most printers work in CMYK, uh, I did have to make sure that the images still looked good in CMYK. Uh, I still paint in RGB. I don't think there's any need to do your actual painting in CMYK, uh, but it's good to check that final conversion uh, once you're done with the painting. Uh, but now outside that, I've never really needed to use or change my color profile outside of RGB. Um, let's see. Do you work with many layers or collapse layers to make it easier to manage? A um, mix of both. I try to. Um, be try to use my layers to save myself time and give myself flexibility. Um, in this case, because it's a pretty simple painting uh, and I've got direct reference that I'm working from, I kind of just have the character on a layer and background on a layer. But if I was doing this for like a piece of, if I was doing this as splash art, then I would probably be sure to have all of like these dreads that are overlapping in front of the character, I would keep those on their own layer. Because what if my art director shows up one day and he's like, hey, this looks great, but uh, this character actually has this V pattern on his shirt. Uh, and if this is all one layer, then suddenly I have a, a pain in the butt task of like, OK, it's there, and then it comes back over here, and then I have to go OK, get the edge and redo a bunch of work. But if I just keep all these things on their own layers, then I can just add that pattern on a layer. It automatically goes underneath the dreads, and I've saved myself time. So uh, for splash pieces, my characters will tend to end up with like, I don't know, maybe somewhere around 20 layers, and then maybe another 20 or 30 for like the background, foreground, and post-processing stuff. So I try not to go crazy overboard with layers because it can get overwhelming pretty quickly. Uh, but they are very useful for saving time and giving yourself flexibility uh, for changes that might happen later on in the process. Yeah. Um, I, I would say maybe for complete beginners, working with less layers make, might make the actual act of learning painting a little bit simpler, like less complex, like yeah. to think about. Um, but it, you know, that being said, it is a, it is a really great tool for, you know, any stage of the process. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, and that's something I'm going to try, uh, or I plan to structure into the course. Uh, the exercises themselves will start very simple, just doing a painting on one layer and then gradually building up to using more complicated Photoshop techniques. Um, I have this, uh, I think whenever you're learning something, it's important to really focus your attention on what it is you're trying to learn. So if you're trying to learn how to, let's say, paint a portrait, then you should be focusing all your mental energy on learning how to paint a portrait. That's not the time to be learning how to use Photoshop and how to use layers and all this stuff. Um, so the more you can be very specific with where you're spending your mental energy, the faster and easier it is to learn things. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think with Photoshop, especially, I think the biggest strength of learning traditional art, at least at first, is that you're not distracted by chr chromatic aberration or layers <laughs> or multiply layers or any of that stuff. You just get to, you know, make an image look cool with very simple tools, essentially. Yeah, absolutely. I would say if you're if you're just getting into digital painting, then probably try to do a process somewhat like this, you know, just maybe keep your drawing on a layer and then try to do the whole painting on just one layer and just focus on your brush and your painting technique and uh yeah just try to do the whole thing with the the brush tool don't worry about digital tricks or hacks or anything like that um those things are great and they can be really helpful but uh, they're not going to necessarily help you learn to paint better so i should make you a better artist right yeah absolutely <laughs> Um, let's see. Uh, people tell me I should complete more illustrations. People also tell me I should do more studies. How should I balance the two? Uh, again, it kind of depends on where you're at in your journey. Um, I think early on, it's good to weight your time more heavily towards studies because that's just going to be a better use of your time because early on, it's important to make illustrations uh, for fun and to test your skills, but you're not going to be keeping many of those illustrations in your portfolio a year from now. So what's more important is learning the skills. So uh, if you're early on, I would spend a little bit more time focused on studies and then, you know, every now and then branch out and try to apply those to a finished piece. Uh, if you've got some solid fundamentals under your belt already. If you've been doing this for a while and kind of know the ins and outs and have a comfortable process uh, and you're ready to start building a portfolio to send to clients, then you can take a bit of a break from studies and focus more on finished work. But I think it's always good to have a, a balance of the two for sure. Yeah, yeah, I think it's uh, like it, it. It also never changes too. Like I, I'm sure plenty of professionals are constantly doing studies as well, and probably go through phases of, um, you know, doing lots of their own illustrations, doing more studies, and you know. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, an advantage too of doing finished illustrations is it can kind of tell you what to study. Uh, if you just sit down with this vague goal of I want to be a better artist, then you might get a little lost in the weeds of like, well, what am I actually supposed to do to achieve that? Uh, but if you sit down and try to do a finished painting, you're going to be working on it and realize, oh, I'm having a really hard time like knowing where to put my shadows, or I'm having a hard time uh, painting this particular hairstyle. And that gives you a starting point for next time I sit down to study, I'm going to look up a tutorial or get some reference and try painting from observation and improve on that thing that I struggled on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's that cliche quote. It's like a, you know, um, every art is just dealing, you know, every piece of art is just dealing, you know, um, where it's like, it, or, or uh, everything has been said, it's just no one was listening, you know, where yep. <laughs> um, like a, a, any problem that you have when it comes to painting has been solved by someone else. It's just, uh, you know, like you can go back to a famous painting from 500 years ago and figure out how Michelangelo or whoever drew arms or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how to draw faces or composition or something, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, there is no shame in uh, getting that sort of advice from, from other great artists. Yeah, absolutely. And it's important to recognize too, that like a lot of the most, groundbreaking innovations are just repackagings of things that most people have forgotten about. Like yeah. the whole yeah. world lost their mind over Team Fortress 2's art style, and rightfully so, because it's amazing and beautiful. But the whole like inception of that was uh, the artist was like, hey, what if Lion Decker was a video game? And so he yeah. made a bunch of characters and tried to style them like Lion Decker might. And there you go, like hit game series. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and e I mean, even the game itself, it's like it's it's a first person shooter, you know, those have existed for, 
you know, a decade or more before that. Um, and uh, they just packaged it in kind of their own way. And yeah, you know, people absolutely. Maybe still, still love it. Yeah, and that's a really good way to think about your own artwork too. Uh, I think a lot of beginners put a lot of pressure on themselves to think they have to come up with something completely original that no one's ever done before. And that's really not the case. Uh, one, because that's almost impossible. Everything has kind of been done at this point. Um, but two, because everything you do will be something that's never been done before because you've never done it before. So even if you're taking a classic trope or a tired cliche, when you make it into artwork, you're putting it through your own lens and your own filter and your own way of thinking. And that in and of itself is going to make it uh, unique to its own degree. So it's really more, it's more important to develop that lens and develop that filter and understand, uh, like develop your sense of taste than it is to try and think of something that no one's ever thought of before. It's a much more yeah, manageable yeah. Well, and I don't think it, like any new idea, it doesn't come out of nothing, you know, like something even like Blindecker came from being influenced by dozens of other artists before him and Rockwell came from, you know, essentially just emulating Blindecker, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and like, uh, you know, knowing that nothing can come from, you know, art essentially has to come from somewhere, like you're just a, an amalgamation of all the influences in, over your entire life. Um, just, I guess, having faith that if you just keep following the process of doing studies and drawing, you'll eventually get to the point where you're uh, confident in saying, you know, saying the things you want to say. Yeah, absolutely. And that's also a great study tip too. Um, a lot of, a lot of beginner artists run into this trap where they have an artist they like, and so they try to copy their style, uh, which is not a bad thing. Uh, you can definitely learn some very useful things by trying to, to imitate your favorite artist. Um, but some people fall into the trap where they just kind of become a second rate version of that artist that they liked. And a great way to avoid that is instead of studying the artist you like, see if you can find who they like. Uh, almost every successful artist has done some kind of interview or post things on their blog or their Twitter. Find out who inspired the artists that inspire you and study those artists instead, because then you're getting to like the the root and the source of the style or the inspiration, and uh, it'll be much easier to sort of convert that into your own uh, style or way of painting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, an exercise I've I've been told by teachers is to choose your you know top three artists that you would like to draw like not necessarily your top three artists because sometimes the art you like doing and the art you like can be different, mm -hmm. um, but you know for being very intentional with you know who you know to be the people that you really um, would love to paint like you know, for for me it's like Phil Hale, Steve Houston and um, I don't know like Moby Frankie or something you know yeah. Um, and uh, knowing where to go uh, narrows it down a lot in terms of what you should be studying. So if you want to paint like Phil Hale, you might not want to be doing as many uh, Scott Robertson car studies, you know? <laughs> right. You might want to understand, you know, how, just how anatomy and composition works um, and gesture. Um, yeah, absolutely. And it's great to, to, when you have that like top three or top five, because uh, then often you'll be able to you'll see similarities between them. And that can give you really good clues as to uh, what you should be focusing on. Like all of the art I like is really heavily anatomy driven or all of the art I like is uh, rendered in a more painterly style or whatever the case may be. Uh, looking for those yeah. commonalities can help give you some direction for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I guess the more you know of like what your strengths are and what you want to be doing, it's going to give you a really good idea of just um, like the kind of art that you will be happy doing for, you know, for a long, long time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like, I, I guess I've been, 
uh, like I'll see artists that I consider as great. They're really great at one thing, but when it comes to another thing, they might not be as strong, but they're masters at oil painting or they're masters at composition or something, but they're not great at drawing from their head or something, you know? Yeah. Um, and yeah, and I still really, really admire them, you know? Um, you don't necessarily have to be a master at, at, com at every part of draftsmanship to say interesting things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is an interesting, uh, kind of a difficult thing with starting art these days is when you're on social media, it seems like everyone is good at everything because you're just yeah. seeing, you're just seeing all of it in a collective and not realizing that like, oh, the one guy who draws really good characters can't draw environments for crap. So, <laughs> um, Yeah. 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 You're only seeing the presentation, like the best stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, and, uh, it's like, I, I, I think it's an important part of social media is acknowledging that it's uh, exactly what, you know, it's a cultivated version of what somebody wants to share about themselves, not necessarily completely accurate to, you know, who they are all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, somewhat of a tech question, what equipment are you using? Computer, drawing tablet, et cetera? Um, so, Computer is just a desktop PC that I built. Uh, the tablet is a Cintiq 32 inch. Uh, I'm working in Photoshop CC 2020. And I think that's it. I have a Logitech camera. <laughs> um, How much RAM do you have? I think 32 gigs. Nice. Yeah. It's a pretty beefy computer. Um, would you say that's necessary for getting into digital painting? Um, no, not really. Um, I've found it to be important for the type of work that I do because splash art is painted at very, very high resolutions and uh, you end up with a lot of layers towards the end. So you need pretty strong uh, CPU and RAM uh, to be able to still paint comfortably without your computer chugging to death. Um, but for a lot of types of art and illustration, uh, you can get by with a, a pretty bare bones PC. Uh, you just have to keep your layer count a little bit lower and don't work quite so high resolution. Yeah, and uh, I, I guess when it comes to the equipment stuff, I know plenty, like I know uh, Esben Rasmussen paints with like a like an old Intuos tablet for when mm -hmm. he was, you know, younger. And he just like, I know plenty of artists that have access to Cintiqs that choose to not use them because that's just not what they're, um, what they, they're used to. So it's not like you need to wait until you have all the software to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Cintiqs are definitely uh, a preference. It's not a, a required standard. Uh, they are, more expensive and you need more desk space. So uh, don't feel like you, you have to get a Cintiq in order to be a successful digital artist. Um, you do need some kind of tablet. Uh, there's been a small handful of artists who've uh, read it painting with their mouse, but uh, that just sounds morbid and terrible to me. So <laughs> yeah, uh, pick, get yourself a, an Intuos or uh, one of those uh, starter tablets and just kind of get used to the the software and drawing digitally. And uh, later on, if you feel like it's worth it to you, you can upgrade uh, to a Cintiq. Uh, and a lot of artists too are doing really great work on iPads with Procreate nowadays. Uh, I know uh, Evan Amundsen, I believe, works almost exclusively on an iPad now, and mm -hmm. several of my artist friends do as well. Um, doing like big difficult illustrations for like magic the gathering and D and D. So it's yeah. very viable as a, a workstation for sure. Yeah. 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 I, I think it's just about getting the thing that you're most comfortable with. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I also, I'm not saying to skimp on, um, software or, you know, investing into your setup as well. I think, um, the more you can invest into your own comfort, you know, it'll, over time pay itself off. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it really 
it just depends on like your your situation and your budget and where you're at uh mentally with your work like i got a i got a cintiq when i was pretty young just because i knew this was what i wanted to do and this seemed like the thing that people were using so i like cleaned my parents house for a year and a half to <laughs> save up enough to buy like the the old 21 inch cintiq and it was it was worth the investment for me because uh, yeah. i knew that i was going to be doing this for uh, years to come but if you're just getting started not sure if this is a hobby or a career or what then you probably don't need to jump right away for the the super expensive stuff but uh, it's definitely worth investing in getting good equipment that's going to last you a long time. Yeah. Um, by the way, I'm answering questions from Provo.com slash 609. And we are uh, doing a giveaway at the end of the stream. If you comment, uh, you can have a chance to win a copy of John's painting course. Yeah. Um, it's coming out next March. It is also on sale right now as well. So. Um, uh, do you prefer to start a painting with color or grayscale? Um, it's going to be in color. I always start it in color. Um, I've experimented around with colorizing grayscale images, and it does have its advantages, but um, the main reason people do it is because they are having a hard time managing their values. Uh, and so they want to start with values first and then worry about color later. Uh, I feel like I've gotten to the point where I'm not having that struggle anymore. So it's just an extra unnecessary step for me personally. Um, but if you find that useful, then absolutely do uh, give that method a try, starting in grayscale and colorizing it later. Uh, and that's something I'll actually show a process for doing that in the digital painting course as well. So. If that's something you're interested in, uh, we will have it. Um, I think people are asking for you to zoom in if you're working on detail as well. I guess the ear counts as detail. Yeah, I guess so. Um, Portfolio advice. Uh, do you select work to match the company uh, that you're trying to work for, or do you show your individual work and hope they hire you for who you are? Uh, depends on the company. Um, if you're applying at a big game studio, they're going to want to see that you can mimic the style they've already established. If you're applying to a, an indie game studio or some kind of, uh, you know, independent creative publisher uh, or like a uh, if you're in a more traditional illustration career doing like editorial work for magazines and newspapers then they're more interested in your your personal voice and style um, so i would mainly say the best thing to do with that is to look at look at your work uh, find what clients are paying people to make work like that in some vein, and then, uh, yeah, reach out to those clients and see if you can get in contact with them um, and build a portfolio that, that fits that need that you've uh, analyzed and, and researched. Um. Yeah, it, it, I don't think there's any linear way to getting a job. Um, I've heard people on Twitter um, just having people reach out to them um, just because they really like their artwork and others spending a long time crafting their portfolios to fit a really specific niche. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and it's always good. Like, you should include all your work in a portfolio. Uh, if you have work that's like really suitable for a video game studio, but you also like to do weird experimental art on the side, like by all means, keep both those things in, just be sure they're separated out into their own categories. So if an art director is just looking for your illustration work, then they can click a button and see all of that in one place and don't have to dig through uh, anything that might not be relevant to them.
let's see. Um, also, be sure to put your contact info somewhere on your portfolio. You wouldn't believe the number of ones I've seen where someone submits something and they have a bunch of great work, but no way to get in touch with them. <laughs> Um, would you say it is possible to get a studio is job over the internet these days? Absolutely. Um, pretty much every studio uh, outsources to some degree. So there's a lot of freelance work to be had. Um, and now with uh, the way the world has changed, a lot of studios are also just allowing their full-time employees to work remotely. Uh, so you can absolutely um, make a have a good career in living as an artist, uh, working remotely, living wherever you want to live, um, and just handling all your business online. Yeah, yeah. So it seems like most studios are going online anyways. Mm -hmm. uh, makes sense. Yep, we've been uh, fully remote for over a year now. Crazy. Uh, do you guys hire internationally? Uh, we do hire through the UK. Um, there are sometimes some weird, tricky tax laws, so we can't just hire anyone anywhere. Uh, but we do have a, a studio and like legal precedents in the UK, so we have employees over there. Also, this is a, a good example of using layers to save yourself time. Uh, I wanted to give this guy some kind of intricate jewelry, so I painted the whole thing on its own layer. And now I can just hit this transparency checker box above the layers stack to lock the transparency, and which is the same thing as before, where now I can't paint outside the lines. And now that I have this shape of the, the earring described, I can just kind of paint on top of it. And if I need to change the hair or anything underneath, then that will be super easy to do because this is all separated onto layers. Um, let's see. Um, hello, I have difficulty redrawing a character every time I draw someone. He slash she looks different. How can I improve uh, to achieve drawing the same character in different perspectives? So I guess they're asking if you can, like, how do you achieve uh, um, consistency in drawing characters? Yeah. Um, the main answer is just to continue uh, working on your fundamentals. Uh, the stronger you are uh, at drawing portraits and figures in general, and the better understanding you have of the anatomy and forms of the face, then the more specific things you'll be able to notice about what makes a particular person look like them, and you'll be able to key into those things uh, when you're drawing them again and again. Um, the other thing can be uh, if your your project is more stylized, you can uh, focus very specifically on certain aspects of the character to exaggerate and be sure those are present every time you draw them. Uh, if you look at a lot of old uh, concept art for Disney animations, uh, there's some really great breakdowns of how the characters are supposed to be drawn and they're incredibly specific with like, the eyes should always be this shape at this angle and the hair always needs to have this flip and be this long. And uh, because they establish those very concrete uh, sort of key features and exaggerations, they're able to have a whole team of artists do hundreds of drawings of the same character and it feels consistent from start to finish. Uh, so big part of it is just uh, keep work working on your drawing fundamentals. And the other part of it is to 
be very specific about uh, what makes your character look unique. Um, this is kind of related. Uh, is it okay to do artwork from a reference the way you're doing now for a client or company, or would it break copyright law? And should I only do that for non-commercial purposes? Um, it depends on the reference itself and how much you change it. Uh, so this reference is from Graphit Studios, and most of their references, uh, I believe all of them actually, are licensed for commercial work. So you can use them as reference and uh, sell your painting or do whatever you need. Um, if you're using an unlicensed reference, uh, then you have to be sure that you're just you're not copying the whole image directly, but rather just borrowing pieces of information from it and transforming it into your own work to the point where if someone put the reference and your painting side by side next to each other, they wouldn't be able to tell that you were working from that image. Uh, so reference is not really about copying. Um, it's more just to provide information. In this case, I'm copying it more closely because uh, this is almost more of a, a study than an illustration. But uh, if I was using this for a piece of splash art, I would probably have like five or 10 uh, like portrait references of different people at different angles and different lighting. And I would grab bits and pieces from each of them, uh, just using them to uh, inform my decision making rather than copying any of those individual references uh, sort of point for point, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I've, I've uh, been around studios where the, uh, I guess, interpersonal, uh, the, share, the art that they share in between the team is pretty much just copywritten from other, like they'll essentially do photo bash images from other people's art, you know. Um, and as long as it's not going out and, you know, being uh, delivered to the public, uh, it, it's it's essentially fair use, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like, I'm sure plenty of studios have mood boards filled with other people's artwork as reference, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, as long as the final product doesn't seem derivative of an unlicensed reference, then it doesn't really matter how you got there. Uh, so it's really just about like, if you use reference and it's not licensed and you're doing professional work, you have to be sure that you're you're transforming it into your own image. Uh, and I find the best way to do that is just to have lots and lots of references. Like if I'm painting a, a flower, um, I can Google that flower, but all of those images have copyright protection. So if I Google 15 of that same kind of flower, I can look at it from different angles, I can understand how it's constructed, and then I can draw my own flower uh, that's not based on any of those images and is purely my creation. Uh, and then I don't have to worry about it at all. And that's an advantage of learning uh, constructive drawing and being able to draw and paint from your imagination is you can take a reference uh, and transform it into something completely new. Like, uh, I didn't do it in this case just for, for time reasons. It's a pretty short demo. Uh, but uh, it would be totally reasonable to take this reference that I'm doing this painting based on, uh, draw a completely different head at a different angle with a different expression, and just use this as reference for color and lighting and where the shadows go uh, and textures of the skin and hair. So if you build up that uh, fundamental constructive drawing skills, uh, it becomes a lot easier to borrow from references rather than copy them. Um, what skills outside of art do you think are most important to an artist? Um, well, if you're talking about a a career in art, then it's incredibly important to have soft skills, uh, which is basically just people skills. Um, if you're making a living as an artist, whether that's as an independent freelancer or working in a studio, uh, you're going to have to deal with people. And 
Uh, if you're easy to work with and fun to be around, then you're going to have a much better career than if you're uh, struggling to talk with people or come off as abrasive or whatever the case may be. So uh, if you're aiming for a career in the arts, it's very important to develop your, your interpersonal skills as much as your art skills. Um, I also think that, uh, you know, having hobbies outside of art that you get your validation from, like if you're really into knitting as well, um, something that you're not necessarily paid money for, but you have some amount of creative outlet for. Yeah. That, that can be really useful. Um, exercise as well, I think mm. is, uh, it might not make you a better artist, but it'll make you, I think, happier on average while painting. Um, it it won't make you a better artist, but something that makes you a much worse artist is blowing your back out or losing your wrists to carpal yeah. tunnel. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, I think exercise does help with that. So. Yeah. And it's great for mental health and focus and yeah, yeah lots of lots of benefits to that. Yeah. Um, I guess uh, we kind of answered this question earlier, but uh, what do you think is more valuable for a beginner in painting? Studying professional artist methods of painting uh, or uh, studying directly from photo reference? Um, a, a bit of both. Uh, I think it's better to study from life and photography because that's the source that every other artist is pulling from. So if you're trying to copy someone's style, like I was mentioning earlier, you probably just going to end up being sort of a second rate version of that artist. But if you learn the fundamentals, which means studying from life and photos, uh, you can then you'll have a foundation that you can approach like, okay, well, now that I have the skills, how does this artist I like take those skills and stylize them in the way that makes me like their work so much. And you can do then do something similar with your own work, uh, but you're not copying them. You're just sort of uh, building on uh, ideas that you've gathered from them. Um, that's in, in terms of style, uh, but the way the question was phrased was uh, studying other artist workflows. And that I do think is very valuable. Uh, if you can watch someone paint, if they have tutorials or if they do workshops or whatever, learning the way that they work and how they make their decisions can be very, very beneficial uh, when you're just starting out as an artist. But that's less about style and more about process. Yeah. yeah. yeah and I, I, I think it's always a combination too. I mean, you can't really answer that question unless you kind of know kind of right that you want to do. There are plenty of artists that are hyper realistic that pretty much only you know, they interpret directly from the reference and others that kind of use the reference as kind of a guide, but not necessarily painting one for one. Um, and it's kind of up to you to, to decide what the ratio is. But I would say every artist, um, you know, does a bit of both to a degree. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it comes back to the, the conversation of reference too, like every professional artist when they're working on their professional art has a page of reference open that they're pulling either inspiration or uh, drawing knowledge from. So um, building that skill and getting comfortable working from photos is, is super important. Yeah. Also as a slight caveat, uh, photos are wonderful and They've made it uh, significantly easier to learn art than ever before. Uh, but if you're specifically studying light and color, you'll get a lot more benefit uh, by painting from life. You know, go out into the world and do plein air paintings or uh, set up a still life in your house and paint that just by looking at it with your eyes. Because uh, cameras will always have a level of distortion to the, the colors and the contrasts and the values. Um, and once you sort of learn this difference, it actually becomes kind of easy to spot artists who've only ever studied from photos because they're the way they use light and contrast has a very photographic look to it. 
um, which is not a bad thing. And that's a style that's used a lot professionally and there's nothing wrong with it. But uh, if you're going for more traditional style work uh, like Magic the Gathering, they tend to want a much more sort of painterly classical look to their work. And a big part of that is um, doing sort of naturalistic lighting setups to a degree. Uh, so working from life rather than from photos gets you much more accurate color information and you can learn how light uh, works in the real world. And then later on, if you're like, well, I want this particular piece to look like it was uh, a photograph, uh, you can then stylize uh, based on that. Yeah. 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 Um, and I, I think whenever you're looking at art, you're only ever going to be able to accomplish like an abstraction, you know, yeah. you're, you're interpreting what you think you can see, not necessarily what is directly right in front of you, mm -hmm. even if you're doing hyperrealism and, um, you know, just the act of painting more, you'll be able to distinguish the kind of stuff you like, um, and I think the key to becoming a better painter is just doing things that'll make you paint more to figure out those questions faster. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is kind of relevant. Uh, Patrick Zigart asks, uh, looking forward to the course when it comes out. Great stream so far. Question for the stream. Uh, how do I find my own voice in art? I love to do studies and learn from other artists. Most that's most of my own art. If it comes, uh, to my own original paintings, I kind of get lost and lose patience really quick because my end result will not get to the level I want to have it. With the study and copy, you know the end result will look good. Uh, maybe you have a good tip for changing the mindset into something more positive. Uh, thank you and have a nice stream. Yeah, that's a, that's a tricky one. Um, part of it, and we kind of, we talked a little bit about this earlier, um, just this idea of like, having grace and patience with yourself. Uh, it is definitely, it's difficult to go from doing studies to doing original work because it is just easier to paint when you have direct reference and you know exactly what you're going for. The goals are very clearly set in stone and you don't have to like do quite as much of that creative problem solving. So it's a lot easier to make a good looking study than a good looking original painting. And you just have to sort of acknowledge and be aware of that fact going in that this might not be your most uh, technically brilliant piece of work because you're trying something new and challenging. And uh, by default, when you try new and challenging things, they're probably not going to be your absolute best. Uh, so it's just important to acknowledge that that's fine and not beat yourself up over it and uh, focus on, uh, like we were just saying, you know, what, what do you enjoy and what is making you want to take the time to make this painting or this comic or whatever it is? Because um, if the reason is just, I feel like I should, then maybe that's not going to get you very far. But if you're genuinely excited about an idea or a concept or a style of painting, then you need to just kind of keep your eye on the prize a little bit and know that it's going to be worth doing a bunch of paintings that might fail. Uh, yeah, you just need that consistency and stick to itiveness. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that when it comes to doing other people's studies, you are right that it's like you're guaranteed to get at least a little bit of a win, but the actual awards to that are lesser than if you, you know, stick through the struggle and you know the pain of doing a bad piece of art you know um like the more that you can just learn the love of painting and saying the things you want to say the better of an artist you'll be and, yeah absolutely yeah. and it's important to sort of develop that skill and mindset too because even as a working professional you're still sometimes going to make bad art <laughs> um yeah. like your your sort of rock bottom quality will be significantly higher than someone who's just starting out, but you'll still make pieces where you're like, oh gosh, I really screwed that one up. And yeah. you have to make peace with that with yourself and know that, you know, we're 
we're people, we're not machines, and we're not always going to do this thing perfectly, even if it's something we've been doing for 15 years straight. Uh, so developing yeah. that self-forgiveness is very important. Um, and we were kind of talking about the, that earlier, where I think when it comes to other things, that's what I was kind of saying with other things outside of art that you find validation from. Like, uh, if you can, uh, if you do a bad painting for the day, um, but you are really excited to go home and, you know, I guess play your video game or do your run or knit a sweater or something, that's, you're not going to be as bummed out about the bad painting than if you have, you know, uh, something else to, I guess, uh, pull joy from. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's definitely important. Uh, if you're, if you're trying to make a career out of your art, it's definitely important to be passionate about it and to invest yourself fully in it. But I'll, don't let that consume your entire personality, uh, or and especially don't let it consume all of your time. Uh, you know, you have to work hard at it to get good at it and make a career and pay your bills if that's what your goals are. Uh, but you're still like a whole person, not just a, an artist or a painter or someone who works at some company. Uh, so having interests outside art and making time to relax and watch TV, play video games uh, is just as important for your overall happiness and well-being. Yeah, yeah, and I, I know uh, Tyler Jacobson uh, is a sword fighter. It's, you know, oh, really? He does, yeah, he does like really intense LARP where he uh, has like you know wears armor and has people whack him with swords and he whacks people with swords. And... Awesome! I did not know that. Yeah, yeah. Um, same thing with Morgan Weisling too. Um, and, uh, you know, Eric, every day. Eric Gist uh, was really into doing like Spartan races for a while. That's cool. Uh, yeah, no, I think, again, I think it's um, like at a certain point, I think as to become a professional artist, you have to really dedicate time to it for a while. But uh, I think to keep it sustainable, you need, uh, you know, to not just be doing art all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I improved really quickly when I was in school because I was painting for, you know, 8, 10, 12 hours a day. Uh, yeah. And I, I don't regret doing that at that time because... I was young and had the time and energy and nothing else to do. So that was a good decision for that particular time in my life. Uh, it's not something I would do now uh, or something I would advise anyone to do, especially if they're, you know, an adult working a full-time job and trying to, you know, develop their art so they can change industries and become a professional artist. I'm not going to tell you to get home from your day job and then paint for eight hours because that's just going to kill you and make you feel like a failure. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I, I think it's uh, like, I think painting should be a safe, like kind of a safe place for you to play as well. Like I know plenty of people who feel like, you know, they work at Starbucks or something or they work, um, you know, at a restaurant or uh, a job in the day and that they're really exhausted at the end of it. And they feel like they have to be able to paint in order just to, you know, do the job. Um, and that stress and that pressure inevitably just makes it way less fun and enjoyable. Yeah. Um, and I guess if you can manage it to make painting a thing that just like, you know, you don't have to force yourself to do, it's just, you know, you, you would rather paint a picture than go skydiving kind of thing, you know? Right. Um, it has to be a thing that's that is super fun and enjoyable. Yeah, and a, if it is something that's uh, enjoyable and fun for you, but you're having a hard time like making time for it, uh, a good thing to look for is when in the day do you have energy? Uh, something my music coach told me was that everyone has time to make music uh, because if you can wake up twenty minutes earlier and spend 20 minutes a day working on your music, then you're gonna make infinitely more progress than someone who says they're gonna work on it when they get home from work, but then they're always too tired and never start. So yeah. it doesn't have to be this monumental undertaking of I'm gonna do seven hours of anatomy studies. Like it could yeah, be, yeah. I have 15 minutes on my lunch break, I'm gonna sketch a figure. 
like that's that's enough and it's more than Absolutely. nothing yeah yeah and it's I, i've heard it's you know people describe all this stuff is it's more of a uh, a marathon not a sprint you know it's like in our career last 40 50 60 years you know you don't have to get as good as you possibly can in a year or two and then start working and doing the best work from there like for a lot of people they're they start doing their best work in their 40s you know mm -hmm. uh, i think the key to all this stuff is to have patience and you know treat yourself like okay you know i'm not necessarily going to um you know i don't want to stop doing this when i'm 40 i'm going to be doing this for my entire life so taking the time to really do it intentionally and do it well i think is a really good idea um, yeah absolutely and art is art is such a monumentally huge thing that like there's no way you're going to learn all the things <laughs> while you're yeah. a student or even a professional or even when you're 90 and have done this your whole life uh there's always something new to explore and learn with art which is uh, part of why it's so much fun and such a such a challenge um so yeah just use what time you have to improve on the things that are important to you in that moment yeah yeah definitely um and I don't think there's a single teacher that can tell you exactly, um, like there's no one that can tell you what the secret is to become a, a great artist, no matter how good they are. I think it's um, kind of up to you to put in the work and, you know, um, like do your best, you know, it's like that there's no brush pack you can get. There's no amount of studies you can do. It's kind of up to you to um, kind of walk that path yourself. Yeah, absolutely. There's like the the objective necessity of like fundamental skills and understanding, but then yeah. what you choose to do with those is what's gonna make you a, yeah. a great artist. And that's just yeah, a, a personal journey that no one can walk for you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, uh, in your course, will you be talking about photo? Well. Will you talk about the equivalent Photoshop techniques uh, for Procreate and Clip Studio Paint? Um, not specifically, because uh, I don't really use those programs. But pretty much all of the information, uh, the vast majority of it is going to be about just painting fundamentals, um, not specifically Photoshop tricks. So there may be a few things that uh, I do in Photoshop that you can't do in Procreate or Clip Studio Paint, but uh, the vast majority of the content is just going to be painting theories and techniques. Uh, and so as long as your painting software has a brush tool, then you'll be able to apply pretty much everything in the course to your own work. Yeah, and I think uh, the things you're teaching are fundamentals of painting as well, which it can apply to tr traditional and um, Procreate, Clip Studio Paint. Um, yeah, you know, I'm sure even like a little bit of like 3D texturing as well. Um, so the rules of color and all that stuff apply and texture apply, you know, across everything. Yeah, absolutely. It's all the all the same skills just applied in different ways. Um, Um, let's see. Did we run out of questions? <laughs> no, we, we have tons of questions. I'm trying to find one that is, uh, there, there, there some of them can be kind of similar. Mm, gotcha. Unique ones. Um, Uh, any tips on choosing the right color? I've always had trouble getting them right, so I stick with black and white paintings for now. Thank you for the stream, by the way. Um, we talked a little bit about this earlier. Um, it's less about choosing the right color and more about understanding the lighting scenario that your figure is sitting in, um, unless you're doing like stylized comic work, in which case it's more it's just about creating 
harmonious or interesting color palettes. Um, but assuming you're talking about painting realistically, uh, the biggest thing is just to learn how light works and how it interacts with colors. Um, I would recommend James Gurney's book, Color and Light. Uh, it's a really, really great resource on that topic. Um, also, I find uh, Jeremy Vickery's Practical Light and Color on Nomon is really great for that. Uh, very approachable uh, way of uh, thinking about color. Uh, that one helped me a lot. Uh, but yeah, it's mostly about learning uh, the fundamentals and how light actually functions uh, that will help you make uh, choose better colors that feel more realistic or more natural. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that uh, like John Osaro's paintings are really interesting for color as well because his colors are kind of all over the place for his paintings. But you know, like he'll paint a uh, figure just purple and neon green and make it work. Um, mm -hmm. it, I, I think a lot of art and in general is about like relative relationships. Like yeah. you know, for proportion, it's like, is that nose in the right spot relative to that eye? Um, or is that value the right value in relation to that value? And if all those answers are correct, then it makes a, a, a nice image. Yeah, and it's really about uh, this is why values are, are such a big deal. Uh, like if I flatten this out, throw a gradient map on it, and do like a crazy blue and like a crazy orange. And if I do something like this, maybe this doesn't read very well because if I take the color out, they're very similar values. Let me get this like a touch darker. So if I get this orange to like this value, so I'm painting the whole figure with just orange and blue, but it doesn't, it's hard to look at because there's not enough value contrast between the two. Yeah. But if I take the orange and boost it up and take the blue and pull it down, then all of a sudden it doesn't matter that I painted the figure with orange and blue because my value structure is still there and the forms are being described by the values themselves. So I can pick whatever colors I want to throw on top of this figure. Um, and as long as my values stay correct and my edges are defined properly, it's still going to feel like a, a three-dimensional form. This version looks very bland compared to that last one. <laughs> <laughs> They're both cool. Yeah. Um, do you believe in natural talent? I see so many young artists online who seem to know all the fundamentals of art. They can pick up everything so quickly and they don't have to focus on doing studies and exercises as much and try not to be jealous, but it's still a bit demotivating. Um, yes and no. I think talent is a thing but I think it has very, very, very little bearing on your success as an artist. Um, hard work and dedication will always outpace talent. Uh, and there's plenty of, if you ask any professor, uh, there's plenty of documented cases of very talented kids' careers going nowhere because um, they think because they're talented that they don't have to keep working and so their skills stagnate while the people who aren't talented work hard to improve and eventually surpass them um, and also on top of that uh, i think everyone has talent it's just a talent for what and i think a lot of a big part of talent is just what are you interested in like i've built pretty much my whole career around um, my, my high level of rendering uh, light and materials and things like that, because that's what's needed for splash art. Uh, so it might be reasonable to say that I'm talented at rendering, uh, when in reality, I just think it's really fun and I'm interested in doing it. So I invested a lot of my time into doing it and got really good at it. Uh, so it might seem like 
uh, to someone who doesn't enjoy rendering, it might seem to them like I'm talented and uh, have some magical thing they don't. But it's really just, it's a thing I like doing, so I did it a bunch. And there's probably something they're really good at uh, that I wish I was better at, but it's a really boring subject to me, so I skimped on it more. Like, um, I know Scott Robertson loves drawing cars. He seems to be having a blast when he's uh, drawing perspective grids and ballpoint pen. Uh, that is literally my worst nightmare. <laughs> so I am not talented at drawing cars, uh, but that's also not something that I need to do that much for my career. So uh, yeah, I have, yeah. haven't needed to like bite the bullet and learn how to draw cars. Yeah, I, I've heard talent essentially uh it, it's essentially just a genuine interest you know it's like what well, we, we kind of talked about it earlier where you know if you really love the idea of painting a lot more than anything else like you'd rather be painting than playing a video game or skydiving or riding a jet ski and you keep it that way it's going to be a thing that you're going to get a lot better at naturally you know um, yeah and uh, a comparison i like to make is that something like learning how to type even though we all know how to type now Typing is actually a very complicated skill to learn from scratch, but because of the necessity there, you know, all the context to your life that typing allows you to, you know, to have communicate with friends better, you know, um, type on the internet, all that kind of stuff. Um, like you learning the skill has become just um, very, you know, almost a necessity, you know, to the fact, to the point where we all know it well enough. Yeah. Um, and I would say that typing in a lot of ways is more complicated than painting. Um, it's just, yeah. uh, you know, there's less excuses to paint in your day-to-day -day life than, than to type. Right. Um, yeah. And that's a big part of it too. Like there's more to a journey of artistic development than just the output that you see. So it might seem to you like, oh, this, this kid has gotten good so fast and I'm still struggling. Why are they so much better than me? Well, maybe they're a kid and they have time to just work on art. And for whatever reason, they're spending their day painting instead of you know, playing video games or doing whatever, um, whether they want to or are being encouraged to or whatever it may be, they might just have more time to paint than you do. And that's not something you're gonna see when you just look at their work. Uh, so you have to not imagine what their life is like and uh, compare yourself to your imagined version of their existence because uh, you never know what the, the circumstances around uh, anyone's journey of growth is. Um, yeah, yeah. And it really doesn't matter what any how good anyone else is, really. I mean... Even the best artists living now, I'm sure if you ask them if they were the best artists, they would say no. It's like, you know, Velasquez was or Sargent, you know, and yeah. you can go to any museum in the world and find masterwork paintings, you know, whether it's in Kentucky or the Louvre in France or England or, you know, where, wherever, you know, you can find masterful paintings, like better than anybody I know will be able to do in their lifetime, you know. Um, whether it's sculpture or just these amazing 30 foot tall, crazy rendered paintings. Um, and if you look at that and you're discouraged by that, I think that like uh, you shouldn't be discouraged by it. I think it should be something that, um, you know, either inspires you or um, just gives you uh, perspective on like, it's not about necessarily what you're saying or well, well somebody else is saying it, it matters what you, like how you feel about it personally more so than more so than anything. Yeah, absolutely. Also a really good uh, lesson. One of my teachers gave me was you're not obligated to look at other people's art. So if you're on Twitter and you're seeing a bunch of art and it's making you discouraged about your own work, take a break from it. Uh, stop looking at art for a month or two and just focus on your own stuff and see how your skills develop and how your perceptions change. And then after a couple months, you know, go back online and see if you want to start looking at art again. And if you don't, then don't like, there's no, uh, there's no art police that are going to 
<laughs> arrest you for not checking your art feed for a while. Uh, and sometimes it's it's helpful to look at others' work, and sometimes it genuinely bums you out, and you just need a break from it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, and, and again, it doesn't matter what anyone else is saying. It matters, I guess. Like, um, yeah, it, it fundamentally, it, like, it matters how you feel about your own work. Yeah. Cool. Um, do you, you do you use a lot of 3D modeling software for your work, like Maya, Blender, et cetera? And do you think VR is going to be a major factor in the art world? Um, yeah. Uh, actually, I think last year I started uh, learning how to use Blender, and it has since become a, a very helpful part of my process. Um, a lot of the times, you know, the, the type of art that I do, the splash art, uh, it's got some pretty ridiculous and impossible poses. So a lot of the times I'll actually like pose a figure in Daz and then light it in Blender. And then I have free, easy perspective and lighting reference. Um, and it, it still requires a knowledge of figure drawing because, uh, you know, Daz models look weird when you pose them and the, the joints and the anatomy breaks. So it's not like a perfect reference, but it's a, a useful starting point. Um, I've also found Blender to be really helpful for uh, like doing more hard surface stuff. Like if I have to design a, a building or put a spaceship in an illustration, um, then it's a lot easier for me to sort of sketch that out in 3D rather than uh, try and draw it with analytical perspective. Uh, again, I still, I still need those basic perspective skills because I have to understand how it works if I'm going to properly integrate a 3D model with my painting. Uh, but the 3D can save me uh, a lot of time and, and legwork um, over just drawing and painting sometimes. Uh, as for VR, I think it definitely has uh, some strong potential. I know some artists are doing really incredible things with it. Uh, Jama Jorbev. I'm not sure how you pronounce his last name. Uh, he's done some really cool stuff with VR because um, he's genuinely interested in it. Uh, I don't know if it's necessarily like the next thing. I think it's just another option that's on the table. And some people will love it, and some people will hate it, uh, kind of like Cintiqs. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a nice tool to have. And if you like using it, you should use it. But if you don't prefer it and you want to stay old school, then uh, I don't think you need to learn VR to like keep up with the times or anything. Yeah. Um, we have a winner for the um, giveaway, by the way. Oh, yeah. Uh, Who's that? It is uh, Dennis Thicklin is awesome. the winner for the course. So we will um, find a way to contact you through email. Congrats, Dennis. Congrats, Dennis. Um, and as a reminder, uh, the course, uh, John's course, is on sale today as well. Yeah. Um, Pre-sale now. First episode's pre coming out in March. Nice. Yeah, get some digital painting wisdom from John Nightmeister. I have a fair amount, I won't lie. <laughs> I'm a, I try to be a humble person, but... I have accumulated a lot of digital painting wisdom. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you are the world's best digital painter, right? Yeah, it's on my resume. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let's see. Uh, uh, how long would you like to go for, by the way? It is, we've been going for an hour and 50 minutes or so. Um, yeah, I think I'm kind of like winding down on what I can do with this piece in a couple hours. So uh, if there's any last minute straggler questions that uh, you think would be worth an answer, uh, happy to go over those and yeah. then we Give can wrap up second. anytime. I will, I will find one. I'll find the best possible question. Um, Um, 
Okay, this is the job related question. Um, at what level do you need to be in order to be job ready, entry level? Um, how can you compare yourself uh, when you see mostly, mostly see pro work on ArtStation? When would you know you are ready to take on the challenge of a real job and not some sporadic small commissions? Um, it really depends on the the company. Um, like you don't have to be, you know, like a League of Legends splash illustrator level to get consistent work as an illustrator. There's a lot of companies making products out there uh, from like indie video games to tabletop RPGs uh, and everything in between. And a lot of those indie projects have much smaller budgets. So they're looking for more entry level artists who are, you know, good, but still building their craft and not quite ready to, you know, charge the big bucks and go for uh, like the big, big name studios. So uh, you can start developing your resume and your portfolio with those smaller companies. Um, if you like, and you don't have to, you do have to be good at what you do, but that doesn't mean you have to be master level to start your career and start getting hired. Um, you can go on my, my DeviantArt page. And if you go to like the the all section rather than the featured illustration, pretty much everything I've posted is still up there. And most of the, like, if you go back to the, I did work for Green Room and Publishing and Pathfinder, and a lot of that stuff is just not that good, but it was still jobs that I got and it helped my resume and it paid me enough to, you know, buy some more ramen noodles that week. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think I would just, keep an eye on your portfolio, um, compare it in a healthy way to the, the portfolios of people who are working at the companies that you're targeting, uh, and just, you know, do, do your due, uh, due diligence of research to, to find companies that could fit your current skill level. Um, and if, if you are not, if there are none, maybe you just need to put that thought aside for a bit and, try to focus on your fundamentals a bit more uh, and build those skills until you really feel like you're ready. Cool. Um, I think that is a good place to end the stream. Um, uh, we, I appreciate you doing this, man. It's uh, very cool of you. Um, yeah, absolutely. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Thank yeah. you everyone for tuning in. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. And as one more reminder, um, John's course is on presale. Uh, so if you'd like to learn digital painting from John, uh, you can do that. And uh, yeah, we're, we're looking forward to it, too, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much.